Really excited about this presentation. Uh, he is a digital marketing strategist, and uh, he's been in Forbes, Mash Mashable, Financial Post, The Globe and Mail, Alberta Venture, Social Media Today, plus a whole bunch of others. And uh, I think that's really all I need to talk about. He's going to come up and speak about some of the mistakes he's learned on the type of content that he's been publishing, and I'm just going to hand it over to him. I, got this. I'm ready. Oh, I have a mic. Yeah. Do I do a double check on this? Can you hear me okay? Are we running? Yes? Good? Everybody can hear me okay? All right. Thanks. We'll leave that for later. Get out of here. All right. So uh, first of all, good morning. Thank you for, uh, thanks to Tony and Connor and the team here at WordPress for having me. And thank you guys for actually joining me for this presentation. Um, today, we're going to be talking about finding your voice. And specifically, I'll share some of the story of my own trying to figure out what my voice is uh, through six years of failure. So it took me six years of consistent failure, and I've only began uh, last year to figure out what my voice is and who I really am and what that really means and how I can contribute. And I can tell you, so it, it took six years to figure this out, this out, and these are some of the stories that I will share with you these are, this is the learning from six years that I'll share with you today. And I can tell you the exact day that everything changed for me. And I'll tell you about that day a little bit as well. So that was December 28th, 2013, when everything completely changed. My whole worldview changed. My content changed. Uh, my traffic went through the roof. My shares went through the roof. All of these new features came in and all that kind of stuff. So I'll, I'll tell you about that moment. Um, on that day, I kind of began a new journey. And uh, that journey is something that I now have the ability to appreciate the fact that I'm actually doing something that's meaningful to me and I have an ability to do meaningful work to me and I have an ability to write meaningful things through my blog and through the content that I create. And that was the biggest, uh, that was the biggest learning. So that being said, we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about three things today. We'll talk about the beginning of the six-year quest. We'll talk about some of the best practices that I've tried during those six years. And we'll talk about three defining moments that changed everything for me. And I'll tell you about some of the results, and, uh, and then we'll wrap it up from there, approximately 25 minutes from now. Um, my name is Ernest Barbaric, like Tony mentioned. If you are on Twitter, you can find me at eBarbaric. I don't tweet a whole ton lately. I, uh, well, I remember like the first time I actually hopped on Twitter, I followed Guy Kawasaki, and there was like hundreds of thousands of tweets a minute, and that was the only thing that I could actually see on my Twitter feed. I don't do that. So I'm trying to get like good good content out to you guys. So um, so here we'll get we'll get started here. So this photo uh, was taken of me and my now wife. Uh, this was at Christina Lake in BC, and that was about um, the sort of like the spring summer of 2008. Three days after this picture was taken, I had a meeting with my boss, who in his office had an HR rep. And they informed me that this was going to be an uncomfortable conversation. And so I was fired. Um, it was an interesting thing because I came back from the vacation on Monday. And uh, you know, I'm getting all the stuff ready. And he's like, oh, Ernest, can we have a lunch, lunch meeting at 11 on, on, uh, on Wednesday? And I'm like, yeah, sounds good. So I went about my business and you know, trying to do I was working for a radio station at the time. And, uh, and uh, at this point in time, I was making about $120,000, $140,000 a year. <clears throat> Uh, life was good. I had three cars, two motorcycles, all sorts of crazy things that I didn't need. These are all the things that, that's the sort of the mental stage that I was at, at that point in time, and th that was what was important to me. And so uh, three days, so Wednesday comes around and I see my uh, boss, the manager, the sales manager, the, big, the general manager guy at, at, the, at the station. Uh, he's in the printer room and he's doing a jig. And I'm like, ha ha, that's really funny, trying to suck up. And uh, a few minutes later, I was fired. So that began my quest. Because at that point in time, I decided that I'm not going to be working for anybody else. I'm going to do things that are really interesting for me and that are really important to me. And so then that was the day that I decided to start my business. So that was about six years ago. At that point in time, I thought I was going to build an agency. Because I was like, I'm going to screw those guys. And we're going to build an agency. I'm going to take all my clients out of radio. And we're going to do all this really cool interactive stuff with websites and so forth. And um, so I tried, I tried doing that. It took a couple of years of trying that to figure out that wasn't the right track. And every, every part of the path 
There were failures in terms of trying to do something and trying to be something that I was not. And you could see that through the content that I was producing, and you can see that through some of the clients that I've had. I was trying really hard to be something that I thought my clients would want me to be. I was trying to write things that I thought other people wanted to read. And so at this particular point in time, so this was like, like I said, so when there was, there was periods of time where there was like, there was some luck in terms of people were reading some of the content, people were coming in, there were, I got like, you know, email, uh, emails about having to do work with me and that kind of stuff, and then sometimes it would be, it would be fairly slow in terms of um, not getting a lot of work in and that kind of stuff. So this is just sort of the, the life of an entrepreneur, I guess. Um, through that time, I realized that producing content and uh, generally kind of like putting yourself out there, I guess, is what people tell you to do when you're an entrepreneur. Um, and I would, the way I was doing it was through content, was one of the best ways to actually gain customers for me because I didn't feel comfortable with doing sales calls or that kind of stuff, so I would just let customers come through me through the content that they would read. And so I started reading best practices. And some of the best practices when it comes to building content and when it comes to blogging where you know, you, you've all probably chanced or you've read you know, hundreds of thousands of different blog posts that are basically saying the exact same thing, only rejumbled a little bit. So I downloaded a bunch of headline swipe files. And I would look at headline swipe files to come up with ideas for blog content ideas. And then I would write on the swipe file. So a swipe file is basically something a journalist used to do that was like clip out different, uh, different um, headlines from different newspapers and put them all in a folder so that if they were stuck, coming up with a headline for a new article, they could just leaf through that. You can actually, if you were to go on Google anywhere and look up headline swipe file PDF, you could probably find hundreds of thousands of different PDFs that people have already assembled for you. Uh, that led to articles such as, I'm gonna tell you right now just so, just so we have a really good, uh, really good understanding. 2010 digital trends, age of the app. Top seven free apps for business and productivity. Five social media blogs worth reading. Okay, the same stuff that everybody else was doing. Then, I actually at one point in time figured out how to build a Google Doc, and the Google Doc has some really interesting interactive elements and programming elements that you can enter into it so that it scrapes other websites. So I had this spreadsheet that would scrape the top 25 websites out of my niche, out of my industry, and it would scrape for the headline, it would scrape for the number of shares and the number of contents for each one of these 25 websites. And I would look through that for ideas in terms of what I should write about. And that came up with make sense of Gen Y and improve hiring with these five social media ideas. Selling social media to the C-suite, how PR fails at blogger outreach. Then I thought it was a good idea to learn about how aggregators work in terms of getting your content shared and seeing how, uh, seeing you know, if other people will pick it up. So then I was on um, All Top and a bunch of other of those, like where you can actually submit your uh, submit your URL and it'll just pull the, pull the feed of your pull the feed of your stuff and then display it on there. It's like a directory. Then I heard about PR web and doing press releases. So then I hopped on the press release train. So basically what it was, it was submitting shitty articles with a backlink back to my website, thinking that's gonna bring me some traffic. That also didn't work. Then I figured it was a good idea to actually connect with some of these other bloggers that were in my niche that had audiences and comment on their blogs, try and build a relationship by commenting. Motivations being that if I commented enough, some of the readers would actually come to my blog after reading my awesome comment. And that also resulted in less of a trickle. So I tried all of these different things to figure out how to create content that was good and how to use that content to bring in the right audience to me. And what I realized that all of these best practices worked for somebody else, they didn't work for me. And that all of these best practices are essentially a lie. There are no best practices that'll work for you. You have to figure out what your own path and what your own way is going to be. And so I'll share with you now three defining moments that changed everything for me. First one was in September of last year. So September of last year, I woke up one morning and I was like, you know what? I have been creating for everybody else for the last five and a half years. 
And yes, you know, my business has been fairly good, but it's been fairly stagnant for three years. So content isn't really doing anything for me. I don't get joy out of it. I actually have to sit down and write, you know, the pick out a headline that I think is going to work, then come up with three different subheadlines, and then put three points per subheadline, and then include some keywords and all this kind of shit. It just doesn't work in reality because everybody else is doing it. So I, what I decided to do that morning in September of 2013 is I'm going to do something for myself. As I, I said that I'm going to start creating for people that are like me. And I'm going to start creating content that I am interested in. So that's where the idea of 26K came from. The day prior to that morning, I read an article by Sir Ray Avery, who wrote about 30,000 days of life. And I would highly recommend actually checking out that article. And what that article was, is he said that based on his family history and based on his, uh, based on his health and so forth, he figured that he had 30,000 days of life in total and he was counting down for wherever he was. And based on those 30,000 days in total, he would prioritize different things. That article struck a nerve with me. Based on my family history and based on the calculations that I had, I have about 26,000 days of life in total. And that's why 26K was born. And it was a podcast about meaningful work. I actually wanted to find meaning in what I was doing and meaning in what I was writing about so that I could share it with people and hopefully help somebody in some way rather than producing five top this and six, seven you know, steps to that and so forth. So that was the first defining moment, waking up that morning and I said, I'm now going to create something for me and hopefully if people like it, they will stick with me. If people don't like it, those are not the type of people I need to be writing for. That was the first realization. The second one was when I started creating that podcast, I lined up a whole bunch of different interviews. And so while I was researching for people to interview, mostly it was like people that I knew in Calgary and so forth that I thought was, were really inspiring to me and I, that I thought were doing meaningful work. So for example, one of the ladies that I interviewed, she used to be a CEO of a, of a, like a big eye correction center that was spanning uh, US and Canada. Um, and you know, the story, her story, you can listen to it on the podcast, was that uh, one day they decided, she decided that she's had enough. So she took the company public and you know, she worked there for a couple of years. And they knew they had to change something, her and her husband, but they didn't know what. So what they decided to do is to sell all of their belongings and whatever was left, they had a party at their house where people would come in and take whatever they wanted. Whatever was left, they gave away, they sold their house, they packed into a car and they lived in a car for two and a half years. So this is a CEO that left to chase something meaningful. They came back and they actually ended up buying a, an art gallery in Black Diamond, which is really cool. You can listen to that story. But one of the other people that I came across was Paul Jarvis. Paul Jarvis is a web designer out of Victoria, BC. And when you go to his website, and the reason why, well, first of all, the reason I came across Paul Jarvis is because I saw an article that somebody shared on my Twitter feed from Fast Company. And it was about marketing is about staking your land and putting your stake in the ground and standing for something. And I'm like, I like that. So I read the article. The article made sense. It didn't talk about web design or any of that kind of stuff, but Paul is a designer. His article got picked up by Fast Company. I went on Paul's website and I read through all of his other articles. Now, as a web designer, you would expect Paul to write about things like, here are the top 10 design trends. What colors to use for your buttons? Uh, have you ever thought about you know, changing your header size? Why sidebars are a bad idea? That kind of stuff, right? His articles were about fear. His articles were about creativity. His articles were about insights that he had after, for example, uh, you know, he, does, he does some Zen meditation, that kind of stuff, those kind of insights. He works out of Tofino half of the year where they actually don't even have good internet access. But he creates articles and he creates content that is from a different place than a normal web designer would write it. What I realized after I interviewed him was that it wasn't about web design. What he told me is that by creating content that I believe in, that other people read, those people that agree with it, those are my people. 
The people that don't vibe with the content that I create are not my people, and that's okay. I don't want them as clients anyways. Because, and I can tell you from my experience, those kind of clients turn into a pain in the ass. It's not worth it. And just to give you a specific example, I had, uh, it, was a, it was Christmas of 2011-ish or so, 2010-2011, uh, right before Christmas, and I had two clients at the same time where we're, we're building these like website projects for them. And uh, both of them didn't want to pay. And it was right before Christmas. The money in my bank account was less than the mortgage payment, mortgage payment at the end of that amount. And that was not worth it. So now, listening to Paul, I was like, that is awesome. And it took me another two months before on December 28th, sorry, I should say December 26th, I sat down and started writing a new article. This article wasn't going to be about marketing, it wasn't going to be about social media or digital marketing or any of that kind of stuff. This article was going to be about things that I've learned about stillness and meaningful work from interviewing 10, 15 people by this point in time for the podcast. And I was afraid. It took me two days to write the article. It took me about two more days to muster up the courage to publish it because everything that I've published up to this point in time was marketing tips, digital marketing tips. I'm a social media expert. Look at me. Look how awesome I am. Work with me. That kind of stuff. This article was called Nine Ways to Create Time, Space, and Stillness for Meaningful Work. It was a culmination of about 10 different interviews that I've done with these different people who I found inspiring, who I thought were doing meaningful work, and how they created time and space to, to do this. And what I thought was kind of interesting, we're all so busy that we just don't create the time. Now, before I had published, I was afraid, I was scared out of my mind, thinking that everybody's read all of my marketing-y stuff, and this is the first time I'm putting this out there as a completely new thing. So I published it on December 28th, 2013. A few days after, it got picked up by Good Magazine. My traffic quadrupled in one day. My shares went up by 300%. Um, the shares that I used to get for my articles were somewhere around like 20, maybe 30 shares or so. You can't really read this. But for this article, the very first time I decided to dip my toe and just see what would happen if I just wrote about things that were meaningful to me, this article was shared on Twitter 73 times, on Facebook 126 times, LinkedIn 29, and Google about another 30 or 40 times which was a lot for me. And if you look at my stats, you see a blip. So then I was like, OK, so maybe that was an anomaly. So I decided to test it out with a few other articles. These are the results. Um, OK, nine ways to create time, space, and stillness for meaningful work. First article that I ever published that was meaningful to me, 250 shares. The science and psychology behind viral articles in your social feeds that was about breaking down how uh, upworthy and viral nova structure their headlines, 75 shares. Do you have a passion project? Why now is the time to start one? Nothing to do with marketing, 220 shares. These three small businesses are rocking Instagram and how you can too. I actually interviewed three businesses, got insights for them, wrote this article thinking that this is going to be helpful to some of the people that are reading this stuff, 75 shares. The last article that I wrote, and this was about a month ago now because I just haven't had the time to write another one, it was called Second Act. Are you making a living or making a difference? That article has been shared 350 times. It crashed my server when I published it because it was sent to Good Magazine, it was sent to their email list, and it was published on the front page. My server crashed. And not only that, but here was the best result of all of these things. This is an email I got two days after publishing that article. Hi, Ernest. Thank you for the second act article. I just read it on the Daily Good newsletter. You'll like this. For the last two weeks, I've been trying to find the time to connect with my current boss and let him know that I will be leaving my current full-time position. My intention is to create my own sales marketing company and still represent my current boss, so I've been trying to wait for the perfect time to speak with him. As I was reading your article today and identifying with everything, he popped his head into my office and asked me to join him for lunch. So now, the opportunity to speak with him has presented itself. I have read your article twice so far and will read it one more time before leaving for lunch. I'm 54, so I have maybe 30 years left to make my mark and leave my legacy.
I want to spend my time working on things that really matter to me. Sorry. Your article arrived in my life at a perfect time. Thank you and have a great day, best Jeff. Now, there is no best practice that makes that happen. That only happens when you're sort of you're sharing what's in here. And that's <coughs> sorry. And that was the beginning of how I started to find my voice. And I'm just now beginning on that journey. So one of the key learnings for me was, um, this is a tattoo that says, nos que te ipsum, it actually means know yourself in Latin. And it's to know who you are. And that's not my tattoo, by the way. <laughs> Just to clarify. I have different ones. Um, know who you are. You have to figure out who you are and where you stand in this world. And one of the most powerful things that nobody can replicate is your own experience and your, your own worldviews. People identify with people. We don't, there's so many articles that are five best this and ten top that and so many of these like mechanical articles that are shared every day, every time, everywhere you look, that the market is just oversaturated with just shitty content. So the only thing that you have to bring, the only thing that somebody can really connect to is when you bring what's important to you out and share that. We want to connect with other humans. There was one resource that I found that was really powerful for me, and I just finished reading the book. It's called Winning the Story Wars. It's by Jonah Sachs. I would highly recommend reading that in terms of figuring out what your brand is. It talks about two different concepts that I really like. One is called The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell, and the other one is called Archetypes, which was based on Carl Jung's work. I use archetypes in a lot of my, a lot of my marketing uh, strategy work, and uh, I, use, I just began to understand what my archetype is. And I just began to understand where I am on my hero's journey. So hero's journey is something that is used in many different, uh, there's 12 stages to it, and there's many different movies. One perfect example was The Matrix. In Matrix, Morpheus gives Neo two pills. And he says that he can take the red one or the blue one. The question is, are you going to keep doing what everybody else is doing and take the blue pill, competing for the same tired eyes, or are you going to rise above and really connect with your readers, share some of yourself, be vulnerable? That's the biggest thing that I've learned from this whole experience. And you can keep going down that rabbit hole and find your voice. That's it. Thank you.